Do you ever struggle with decision making? You know, when someone asks you to do something, do you ever dread saying yes, but feel powerless to say no? Do you ever feel like you've agreed to too much and now your schedule is just crazy? Me too. That's why I wrote this book, The Best Yes. I know firsthand when a woman lives with the stress of an overwhelmed schedule, she'll ache with the sadness of an underwhelmed soul. But if she learns to make better decisions, she'll have a better life. That's why I'm really looking forward to being together as we learn to more effectively use the two most powerful words, yes and no. We'll learn to make better decisions and a better life, a best yes life. But we'll need wisdom. After all, you make your choices and then your choices make you. There aren't very many things in this world that are universal and unchanging and translate across cultures and throughout history. In fact, I only know of a few and time is one of them. You can count on the fact that there are always 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and there are never more than 24 hours in a day. Time is an anchor for the world. You may have noticed the clock behind me. I'm currently standing in Greenwich, England at the Shepherd's Gate clock. This clock called a slave clock is linked to the master clock housed in the building behind me. That sets the exact time for the world. It's called the Greenwich Mean Time. All clocks around the world are set by this one clock. You can always count on it to be set correctly. You know, a clock must be set to the right time or it's useless. A tree must have a healthy root system or it will die. A house must have a reliable foundation or it will crumble. And a heart must have godly wisdom or it will follow the pattern of foolishness. So what is wisdom and how do you get it? Where does it come from? And I guess, how do I set my heart to wisdom? Psalm 111.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'll be honest, the fear of the Lord has made me pause when I've read that verse before. Not just pause, but kind of dance around what that means or skip over it as one of those verses I'll just have to figure out when I get to heaven. But in light of wanting a heart set to wisdom, the fear of the Lord being the beginning of this, well, I can't skip it. I must unpack it, understand it, so that I can live it and set my heart to wisdom. So let's get a deeper understanding of both the word fear and the word Lord from this passage. There are several variations in the Hebrew for the word fear used in the Bible. And one of those is pahad, which means terror. This isn't the word used in Psalm 111.10 in reference to the fear of the Lord. The word that's used is yera, which in context of this verse means a reverence for God. The Matthew Henry commentary says, the expression that describes reverential attitude or holy fear, which man, when his heart is set aright, observes towards God. I like to think of this observes towards God as looking for the hand of God in everything. So back to our verse, when we have a reverential attitude and look for the hand of God in everything, we start seeing things from the perspective of wisdom. This becomes our focus, the fear of of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now that we've discovered more about that word fear, I also want to look at the word Lord used here. Just like this clock is an unchanging anchor by which all other clocks can be set with certainty, 
I need to anchor my heart in the Lord so that I can set my heart to the wisdom of God. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 1.24 says, Jesus is the power and wisdom of God. Then Colossians 2.3 says, In Christ are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In other words, in order to have the proper reverence for the Lord, He must be our Lord. So combining what we've learned so far about fear and Lord, once Jesus is the Lord of our heart, and the focus of our heart, we've unlocked the door to obtaining God's wisdom. That's the head knowledge of fear of the Lord. Now I wanna give you some heart knowledge that comes straight from Proverbs chapter two, verses one through six. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. What these scriptures are explaining is how to have that heart knowledge or understanding of the fear of the Lord. That, that part, accept my words, get into God's word. That's what we have to do, get into God's word. And then the store up com my commands is letting God's word get into you. Just like when you go into a restaurant, it's not enough just to look at the menu. You have to order from it and actually eat the food in order to be nourished by it. Well, the same is true for God's word. We have to accept it and store it up inside us. That next part, turn your ear to wisdom. That means listen to wise instruction from God and wise people in your life. Then apply your heart to understanding. Don't just listen to wise instruction, but apply it to your current situation. Then call out for insight. Ask God for insights you wouldn't think of on your own. Then cry aloud, pray out loud over the situations where you need wisdom. Look for it. After you ask God and pray about it, actively look for God's revelations as you talk to people this week, as you sing praise songs that you hear, as, as you listen to messages at Bible study. Look for the hand of God in everything and then search for it as hidden treasure. Treat wisdom as one of the greatest treasures that you could ever acquire. Then it says, you will understand. I will understand the fear of the Lord and get wisdom. Head knowledge of wisdom and heart knowledge of wisdom, both are so crucial. You know, since I've been here in London filming this curriculum, I've become more and more passionate about this best yes material and how desperately people need wisdom, how desperately I need wisdom. This wisdom we've been talking about, well, it's different than the world's knowledge. It's just, it's different. It's, it's life changing. It's perspective rearranging wisdom that pierces the heart and redirects the way we live our lives. Just yesterday, I was visiting one of our filming sites talking to a park ranger named Gareth. Gareth was a delightful man and I have no idea where he stands with the Lord. I don't, I don't really think he's in a place where he's going to church, but as Gareth and I were walking along a path, he was asking me what I was doing here and I explained I was filming this curriculum for my new book, The Best Yes. Then of course he asked me what everyone asked me, what is the best yes about? And I explained to him, you know, how we schedule our time is based on the decisions we make. So how we use the words yes and no, two very powerful words, that determines how we set our schedule. How we set our schedule will determine how we live our life. How we live our life will determine how we spend our soul. 
I explained to Gareth that we've got to make decisions today that are wise. And wise decisions today are decisions that are still good for tomorrow. As I was explaining all of this to Gareth, his face kind of got real solemn and his expression kind of dropped. And he leaned back and he said, you know, just last Friday, my mom told me she's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. She only has six weeks left to live. As he said that, suddenly I realized that Gareth needed something more than an explanation of my book. And I really realized that when he said, you know, Lisa, I woke up this morning. I didn't want to come to work. I've been so sad about my mom. I knew that there were two assistants who could do my job today. And so I was laying in bed just thinking, I'm not going to get up. But then I decided to go ahead and come to work. And I'm so glad I did. I think I was supposed to hear about this best yes message. I think that you've got some wisdom that I need right now. And I said, Gareth, you know what? I think you're right. Here's what I want you to know, Gareth. Evidence that we're having this conversation today is evidence that God sees you. God sees your need. God cares about you and God cares about your mom. So here's how you can make a best yes decision today, Gareth. I want you to think about six weeks from now, if that's how long the doctors have told your mom she's got. I want you to think about six weeks from now sitting at her funeral. What are you gonna wish that you had done? What investment are you gonna wish that you had made with your mom? Gareth, this is a gift. You still have those six weeks. So decide right now that best yes investment that you can give to your mom. And Gareth said to me, Lisa, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go home today and I'm gonna write her a letter of how much she's meant to me, all she's done for me and how much I love her. You see, that's what this means. This, this looking for the hand of God in everything. I don't know where Gareth stands with the Lord, but I do know I was supposed to impart this best yes wisdom. Gareth didn't need another book. He certainly didn't need a philosophy lesson. He needed wisdom, the Lord's wisdom for these fragile moments leading up to his mother's passing. And through our conversation about using wisdom and discovering what his best yes decisions are right now, he experienced God. And I suspect gaining this glimpse of God will lead Gareth to a choice. Will he believe God and follow him or not? And honestly, we have to make that same choice. Even if we know the Lord, we have to choose to follow Him, not just with our salvation decision, but with our daily decisions. So much of my study of wisdom has brought me back to the book of Proverbs, which contains counsel on every area of our lives and teaches us how to develop spiritual discernment so that we can make wise decisions. My friend Wendy Blight recently shared with me that it's clear from reading Proverbs that wisdom and folly, wisdom and foolishness, each want to control our lives. We just have to make a choice which one will. So this week, I want you to identify a situation in your life where you need wisdom, where you need to discern a best yes and match it with a verse or maybe several verses from Proverbs. Apply those verses, pray those verses, talk about those verses with your wise friends, and wisdom will be waiting for you. You know, I'm really looking forward to the next five weeks together as we learn to more effectively use the two most powerful words, yes and no. We'll learn to make better decisions and a better life, a best yes life. So we'll need wisdom. Today, we discovered the beginning of wisdom. In session two, we'll study a section of scripture that maybe you haven't read before. It's focused on a woman that established a pattern of wisdom and how it saved her city. Then the next week, we're gonna study how wisdom must be practiced in our daily life. In session four, we'll learn that in order to protect our best yes decisions, we'll have to learn the power of the small no. Session five, people pleasing. We must not confuse the command to love with the disease to please. And then in the final session, we'll bring it all together by imagining how the best yes can help you be more confident in your wise decision making. After all, you make your decisions and then those decisions make you. 
It's gonna be a great six weeks.